gentlemen, this is Monochrome Talk Show number 11, live from Seabase in Berlin. And now, a big fat applause for Monsignore Godes Kresputma! necessary to tell you the story in this location. A specific use is never inherent to an object, even though technical demagogues uh, like to claim that it is. Uh, for example, uh, compare the term self-explanatory uh, with the term archaeological finds. Okay? Uh, turning an object against the use inscribed in it means probing its possibilities. Indeed, and I have to jump off the stage now, indeed, I'd like to pound in a nail with a power drill. But, I tell you, at the moment, the fear of freedom and the fear of responsibility predominate. I don't use a power drill to pound in a nail. Okay, why do we tell you this? Okay? Well, uh, we came across a book, it's called Tales from the Tech Line, and the subtitle <laughs> identified it as hilarious, strange but true stories from the computer industry's technical support hotlines. Okay, um, it was published in the late 1990s, and uh, there are a couple of stories about people who ask in software shops uh, about word for Game Boy, for example, or people who think their Netscape beta version doesn't work because they have a VHS computer. Uh, and uh, those who evacuate their homes because of uh, the Apple error message with the bomb icon <laughs> on it, okay? Uh, or those who think uh, the mouse is a foot paddle. Or mm, there's this really, really nice story about a guy, and you probably heard, heard about this one, uh, that thinks that the CD-ROM holder uh, is a coffee, uh, coffee cup holder. Yeah? Uh, no, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe a small excerpt. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm the techno. Alright. Um, now I'd like you to quit any programs you are running and close any windows you've got open, please. Uh, well, uh, okay. There are only uh, two windows here in the basement, and they're both already closed. No, no. The windows on your screen. <laughs> yeah. Funny, isn't it? Yeah, one might think uh, this uh, is poking fun at others. That probably was roughly the intention of the publishers as well. A few laughs uh, on somebody else's expense. A grin for the stupid, uh, a joke uh, collection for the happy winners of the digital two-class society. Get wired or you're toast. Even the field of humor seems to be trimmed to productivity. Okay, but wait. You haven't laughed a lot, so that's good. But let's change the reading. These Luddites of inability are the saving clock in the cogs of the machinery of progress, the human factor in the simple-mindedness of the programmers of our future. Inability is a glorious, unknowing, is a virtually miraculous deceleration. It is because it's a sneer at the high-speed processes of our capitalist technological world. Oh dear, dear people, honorable failures. The clicking of your keyboards, and some of them, of course, have been hacked here. Uh, the keyboards, the clicking of your keyboards is the erosive crank 
of the meat grinder that you are doing ways out. Your approach is the right one. The information age is an age of permanently getting stuck. Greater speed is demanded. New software, new hardware, new structures, new cultural techniques. Lifelong learning? Yes! The company can't fire the secretary just because she can't cope with the new version of Excel. No. They can count her keystrokes, they can measure her productivity, but they'll never be able to sanction her inability. Because, never, because it is imminent. The Peter Principle, you might have heard about it, the Peter Principle has to be applied to humanity as a whole. Okay, now I tell you what's the Peter Principle. Yeah, uh, there's a little joke about the Peter Principle, but basically uh, it's uh, a concept of hierarchology. A person rises higher and higher and higher in the hierarchy of life. And suddenly the person, until one, the person reaches a point where no one will be longer promoted. So, for example, if there's a guy who's a soldier, he gets to be a lieutenant, then he gets to be a major, and suddenly he stays a major all of his life. Because he's just too stupid to become a general. So that's the Peter Principle. So everywhere in society, there are failures, there are human failures sitting in hierarchies. Okay, so, nothing other than a conspiracy of ignorance, both natural and artificially and artfully cultivated, can save us from the last step into a world that we no longer understand because it couldn't care less about us. Endless possibilities for failure await us. These people, the failure, the failure people, they cannot be laughed on. On the contrary, these stories should be read as a eulogy in honor of dissidents. Someone I know uh, recently defined uh, a personally spoken uh, sample as his uh, standard error sound in Windows uh, XP. So we are not discussing Windows XP now, but his standard error sound uh, was a text, or still is a text. <laughs> Yes, Geschäften! Just piss off. Okay, uh, well, uh, this is hardly uh, congenial. It's not really funny. It's, of course, irritating if you hear it like every five seconds, all the time, if the guy's working. Uh, but uh, it's more than apt. So be it. Go forth and make mistakes. Small ones and big ones, nice ones and stupid ones, trivial and catastrophic. And while we are at it, be sure to watch your spelling. Okay, thank you very much for being here. Welcome. This is talk show number 11. I introduce uh, to you our content manager, Roland Grazza. And our wonderful host in red, Johannes Grenzbrenner. Mm. Oh, no, no, no. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We had a lot of technological problems, we had a lot of failures tonight, and it's so beautiful to have so many failures and then starting like one hour late or something like that. A little bit more that's fine, that's okay. fine, that's fine. Uh, it's an honor uh, being here in Berlin, and uh, yeah, it's a city well known for its bunkers, you know, and uh, opinion leaders, uh, <laughs> and... Berlin, Berlin! Ah! Stop the Berlin, Berlin! No, sorry. no, 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 sorry. sorry. Pop culture. Okay. Uh, but 
But you two, I, I, really, you I, really, I really would love to meet Dieter Hallerford in person one time. Oh. Yeah. Yes, whatever. Uh, actually, it looks a little bit like Conrad Becker, but uh, okay. It's an honor being able to broadcast right from the center of Nerdismo, Seabay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we found a logo on the net. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> stop laughing. If you're laughing, you. Okay, I thought that. The boo, the boo is the best in entertainment. Okay, so uh, that's why we have a couple of tech-oriented topics tonight. Well, uh, today, it's not today anymore, it's tonight. Uh, yes, and first, here is a discovery we made in February in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, this is from the parking lot of Google. Uh, you know Google? Google, that's the thing that's like web crawler. Yeah? Uh, and uh, you see, uh, now they are even producing butt plugs. <laughs> oh. Emerging market. Emerging market. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, no. I think we need, I, we need you person on the stage. What person on the stage? Maybe. A new person on the stage. Yeah. Ah. Maybe it's it our first guest. Maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe, maybe. maybe. Uh, I hope. I hope he he rebooted correctly, and I hope uh, we can introduce to you Krach, the lovely robot. Ah. Thank you. 
via Krach. There were a lot of books and articles about possible uh, inhabitants of other planets, uh, you know. Uh, and many people believe that intelligent beings might live on the Moon or on Mars or on Venus, but since travel to other planets was not yet possible in the 19th century, some people suggested ways to signal the extraterrestrials even before radio was discovered. Uh, there was a guy called Josef Johann Littro, and I think we should do it together. Josef jo Johann Littro! I think he was what a, a Prussian name. Guy. What a name. A Pru Prussian blue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Johann Josef Littro proposed using the Sahara, you see, uh, the Sahara, uh, as a giant blackboard. Okay? Uh, he wanted to dig giant trenches like this one, fill the trenches with water, put kerosene on top of the water, lit the kerosene, and then four giant, giant letters that extraterrestrials could watch from the orbit. Okay? Great idea. Yes. Berlin. That's Berlin. Big. 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 Uh, yeah. The kerosene would burn for a couple of hours, and I would say it never happened, but maybe we could try it. But at least, I mean, we are in a, in a spaceship here, so it's possibly not necessary yeah. anymore. Okay. Well, that's what I call giant science. And now, please welcome our first talk guest. Karin Harasa! Warm welcome! Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Please uh, take a seat. No, on the microphone. With here. The We're not laughing about the microphone, we're laughing with the microphone. Um, yes! Karin, it's wonderful that we have you here. We, you are actually from, from Vienna, so that's why we know you quite good. But nowadays, you're all the time in Berlin. And uh, you told us that you want to talk about facts, facts and, and fictions. That's your special, <coughs> that, that's that your was special science uh, topic. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about it? Um, yes. I I don't think that I wanted to talk about fact and fiction in such big terms. I wanted to talk about why scientists still find it promising to, uh, to when they talk about their scientific research, they often use science fiction images. Mm -hmm. So this is actually what I wanted to talk about, and I find that on the one side uh, I understand that, and I, there are good reasons to do that, but I also find it very problematic to talk about science in the mode of science fiction. So I don't want to talk about science fiction and facts and whether science fiction does it right or wrong, that's very boring. No, that's boring. I mean, there are, there are a couple of, of, of people in science, like the late Carl Sagan, for example, who almost like stated they came from science fiction and then they turned to science fact. So... But they are liars. That's not true. That's not true? <laughs> no. Why? <laughs> Simply not true. That's how they like to stylize themselves. Because science is very boring, so uh, scientists want to think of themselves as, as very creative persons. But if you know science, you know it's a really a very boring business most of the time. Okay. So, any any scientists in the room? Show us your hand, please. Uh, we have to be like not 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 scholars, scientists, please. There is a difference between the uh, like lab rats and. Okay, I mean, you sent us a couple of JPEGs. For example, we have this JPEG here, it's like a cell or it's something cell, like that. Yeah. Okay, why did you send us this JPEG? Because it reminds me of a space image. And, uh, for example, in all the nanotech uh, talk that is going on at the moment, that is concerned with cells and very small uh, molecular things, very often um, images of space are used, like nanotech is very often uh, thought of like little spaceships that go around in, your, in our blood circulation. And so I find it very interesting that even a cell has to look like uh, outer space. I mean, we have the next picture, for example. Maybe that's, can, that's nice, yeah. you see. You have tiny little scientists inside your body that like, stimulate yeah. and, and uh, make your body work. This is an image. Really? 
an image of our, uh, I think it's an immune system, and the command center of the immune system is visualized as if it was a command uh, center of a, a spaceship, which I find very interesting. And there, there are a lot of beards uh, in, inside the immune system. So, ah, yeah. okay. that's the I mean, that, that's rather French, I would say. Or I mean, that's a French approach, or is it a French approach? Because I, I know that all the French, uh, the French uh, cartoons that somehow try to deal with science always have a really like a really s special approach to it. I mean, even Captain Planet, uh, uh, a French cartoon series that deals with, I think it's ecology. They have always a really strange, strange approach to stuff like that. Mm. But I think this is very familiar because uh, scientific research is not only boring. I mean, the process of research is quite boring, and the things that they find out are quite complicated. So they have to invent very uh, easy to understand images to 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 show what they do and mm -hmm. to make us understand. So I think this is it. This is one of the problems that those, those p images they're simply too easy to understand. Okay, so uh, what should uh, scientists then try to do? I mean, you're in science communication. I think you deal a lot with the problems of communicating science. Yes, I do, but I'm at the same time, I'm uh, myself a researcher, so I'm, I think I know both sides. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I don't have any straight advice for researchers how to communicate science. Maybe they shouldn't be forced to communicate so much, but mm -hmm. they should have more time to do their research. Maybe that's okay. one of the things. <laughs> um, um, and I don't know, what I think they should do is, uh, if they tell the public uh, about their research, they should inform us what they really do, and about their real motivations and how they really come to their uh, research products, because what we never see on images like this is how research works. Okay, never clone alone. <laughs> never. Like, like never go swimming alone or something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah, probably. Okay. But, yeah. okay. This is quite nice, actually. Okay. Uh, so, I, yes, I think researchers, researchers should be much more open about what they really do and what the, the real results are. Okay. I mean, uh, in science fiction, most of the time, uh, the way how science is presented is rather... I mean, I mean, it doesn't actually play a big role in science fiction to present how the science works. I mean, the science normally is rather... I mean, there is, of course, hard science fiction and stuff like that, where they try to get the stuff accurate and why the moon explodes and what happens then and blah, 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 blah. But most of the time, the science in science fiction is rather like a small, small percentage of the actual story. And that's why, because, it, that's because science actually is boring, or... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a different question. I mean, okay. that, that, that's, uh, that's the concern of science fiction, which I find a, a great genre, and I think uh, science fiction is the best when it uh, shows, when it makes, uh, makes us makes us see how, uh, how science does not work. So if sci scientific facts are shown in a wrong way, this is much more interesting than how than to, to like do this hard science fiction approach and now oh, if we use sci science right then we will have a wonderful and beautiful world or a dystopian world. Okay, so I don't have any idea how, of how science should deal with facts. I only want to talk about how uh, researchers deal with science fiction. Okay, <laughs> so how, how do they do? How do they deal with it? I, so you think that most of the researchers uh, are somehow stimulated by science? You in, in, their so. self, in their self-presence? No, I think they use science, science fiction images to, to talk about their own work. Okay, I mean, we could possibly go to the next, uh, to the next image. You see this one, for example. It's the 2006 American Nanoscience and Technology Conference and called for papers. Uh, I mean, that's basically a picture of Las Vegas, or? Yeah. Okay, um, I mean, La Las Vegas itself is kind of... I mean, that's virtual reality, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's just a, a bit of a, a, a futuristic side of, of uh, Las Vegas with a couple of more skyscrapers than they usually are there. Okay, but on the, on the upper left corner you see this this triangle and, and so most of the symbols they use and stuff like that are rather simple and actually look like patches of, of, of science fiction commanders yeah. in, 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 in space programs. So they, they love it, don't they? Yeah, they do, it. they do love it. And I think it's 
it's understandable mm -hmm. that they, because uh, science fiction gives a gives a big opportunity because um, if you show your own research results in a futuristic scenario, you either tell the people um, this is inevitable. What I do in my research will be your future, or you have a very good selling uh, argument for your, the product you invest your time in. So this is very handy for researchers. Mm -hmm. Because they have a deal with the future, they are in the future, and uh, being with the future on the side of the future is always a good thing. Okay. This is why I think they use sense, and, and sense, sense fiction images. It's, but like the stock market. Yeah. yeah. To say, oh, this okay. is my future, and I will bring it to you. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah. I see. I mean, I I, I get the point why why you send us all the the JPEGs. Yeah, I see. You have like ah. I, I, I think uh, those like graphics were actually really top in 1986 or something like that, or uh, <laughs> like like well the, the, the first like like uh, like Commodore 64 cracker intros looked like that. <laughs> and nowadays, uh, okay. Nowadays they, it's, it's quantum mechanics and nanotech that still uses these images. Okay, maybe the next one. That's what I really like. One. It's the, the Robo Sapiens. I mean that's. Uh, the evolution of a new species. I mean, you have to imagine. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, by Peter Menzel and Faith the Lucia, uh The creators of material world. Whatever that means. Yes, <laughs> the reason I sent this image is because, uh, of course, robotics and uh, artificial intelligence are two research uh, areas that are especially fond of uh, science fiction scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, and why are they fond of it? Because they uh, want to present as research and technological, um, in, um, technolo technological topics if, as if they were like natural evolutionary processes. So uh, this is why they use uh, the Robo Sapiens as if the robot was a new stage of, of humankind or a le like a natural process. So this is another reason why science fiction scenarios are so. Uh, well, so used, so well used by research because it presents research as a natural process that is kind of part of human nature and kind of a, uh, a natural, forthgoing thing of uh, history, which I don't believe in, and with, 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 uh, which I think is, is a really bad propaganda, because uh, of course the interrelations of technology and society and historical processes are much more complex than a like natural process. Okay, maybe the next picture. I mean, that we have seen that all, all over the world, all over. Uh, like, I mean, I think, I think it's one of the pictures I, 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 I could, I could see like in, in, in the Spiegel or it's like in, yeah, in, 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 uh, in Time magazine and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Most of the time, those images don't actually transport anything. Uh, and uh, so actually, and you would say uh, the good part uh, about. Sending images like that in press releases of scientists, that the good part is that it's actually not saying anything. Maybe yes. It's, a, it's nice images. We think we understand what we see, and it looks kind of futuristic or kind of uh, outgoing. This is like, uh, it's, again, it's a nanotech yeah. uh, uh, thing. Yeah. But so, and it's clear. Uh, we, 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 we think this. We know what we see, but in uh, reality, we don't see any, anything, and that's uh, what a lot of science communication does. It but doesn't it's tell a feedback loop because yeah. if, if you're uh, as the public, you're always confronted with uh, science press releases and, and pictures and images and stuff you see on television, stuff like that. It always looks somehow exactly. like that, yeah. uh, and then you you think that science looks like yeah. that. So they are generating an image of science that is not that is uh, totally wrong because. Yeah. Uh, Anybody ever been to a lab and seen how messy it is there and how uh, researchers don't ever know where they're going to uh, end up with their research? So what I would uh, like much more is to see the messiness of research and see the little steps forward and uh, all the things that are really uh, the interesting thing in research and not those clear images that really tell us nothing. So, uh, then that then our future is bright and wonderful. Yeah, it's bright, you see it, it's a tiny little sun that's probably gonna die and you have to fly to a spaceship and boost it up, as we see in uh, the cinema at the moment. Um, okay, then I would say uh, solar energy is free, of course. Uh,
We only need to invest to collect it. Yes, and we have to, of course, we have to invest in solar research. Okay. So this is the the, the loop you also yep. uh, meant. So they provide us with images that tell us that the future is going to be good, but only if we okay. give them enough money to do okay. their research instead of tell, telling us about their failures. And the failures, that's actually the good part because I was talking about failure all the time. Yeah. And that's what, what, what science never communicates is the millions and millions of errors and failures to, to get and the mess. Um, whatever, to, to get my, my notebook that doesn't even work after I bought it, so it's fine. So I'm, I'm, I'm the beta tester of my own notebook and that's, that's what I like. I would say thank you very much for being here, Karin. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. time, but uh, Karin, uh, we have a song especially for you. We didn't want to sing it for you when you were on stage, but I think we're going to sing it now for you. And for uh, this reason, uh, I'd like uh, to welcome uh, Evelyn Fühlinger on stage. Evelyn, come on. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. hello, hello. Uh, it's a little bit... Uh, about how science and scholarship works or may be working and I'm pretty sure that you in the audience and especially you, you, you Karin know that Wissenschaft, you know, ah, that's, that's such a beautiful term, Wissenschaft, how we call it in, in the German, is still uh, one of the predominant power forms of the bourgeois society. That's how it is. Okay? Uh, there uh, have been a couple of uh, feminist interventions in the last years, but still, uh, it is a centuries-old way to stabilize the male power system and to find an objective way to stabilize uh, and to consolidate its rule in theory and practice. Okay, scientists talk about objectivity and they talk about truth, uh, and you know what they're actually really talking about. And one example is uh, the field of German studies. You know, German studies. Mm. Any, any German studies students here, or people who did German studies and stuff like that, no? Mm. Tell you something about it. Ah, German linguistics. Mm. Okay. Uh, you probably have heard about the medieval song of the Nibelungs. Ah, the song of the Nibelungs. Or in German, das Nibelungenlied. Okay, das Nibelungenlied. Also, Moment, das, das klingt schon faschistisch, wenn man es ausspricht. Nibelungenlied. <laughs> but, okay? But, 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 but. There is a big debate about this epic poetry, uh, about uh, the origin of this epic poetry. Was it uh, written by, for example, by a knight? Or was it written by a, by a clergyman like ourselves? But at least all researchers believe that it was written by a male person. Okay? But the text is very peculiar. It's not so fascistic at all, as you might think. It's very peculiar uh, because it tells a story about powerful women. Okay? And concerning the lead characters, there is a misogynist rewriting and a pro-women interpretation of the song of the Nibelung. So a pro-women and a contra-women version, version to read it. Okay. And uh, Bertha Lösel Wieland Engelmann yeah, was born in 1924. And her biography tells a lot about a woman who wants to work in a very male-centered scientific community. And her thesis about the Song of the Nibelungs was that it was written by a nun, a female nun, of course, a nun, from Niedernburg here. Yeah? An idea that hasn't uh, been well received uh, by her male colleagues, of course. But her assumptions aren't too far off, actually. Yeah? The unknown 
female nun and Beata Lösel Biela Engelmann are interfaced to a second female history of literature that only exists in a fragmented form right now, okay? Accept your emotions with that topic, okay? And now we want to sing a song for you. Listen to a song about a song and about two women. Evelyn?
Geography. We love Paul. We love Geography. 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 Catholic nun and a Catholic hun. That's, it, ha that it happens. It happens. Yeah. From time to time, it happens. Uh, and uh, we love to collect typos. So, tip failure. So, if you have nice, beautiful typos, please send them to us. There's the English <laughs> homepage and uh, the German homepage for our beautiful typos. Okay. We have to ask everyone once again on stage, I would say. Or Please know. come again. We just had her singing, and now we'll have her talking. Evelyn Furlinger. Magistra. Magistra Evelyn Furlinger. Okay. Oof, oof, oof. My coat doesn't work at all. So, you are a regular on uh, the talk show, uh, and you're always talking about linguistics and stuff like that, and you have a column called Wicked. Words. 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 Wicked words. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, tonight you want to talk about planned languages. Or Auxiliary words. languages as we like to call them. Auxiliary actually. languages. Auxiliary yeah. languages. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I just saw one of the old talk shows last mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. and I had to see the part where I was on yep. and I noticed that I'm totally dominant so I'm, I'm totally dominating the stage, and so I thought I would do it differently this time and okay. not say anything at all. Okay, okay. You just ask me questions. I ask you questions. Oh, Are come you? on. Come on, it's so nice. Normally you have to ask questions, and you don't know if you ask the right questions, and then Karin looks at you and thinks, what the stupid question did you ask me? Right now. Yeah, that's uh, exactly okay. what I was... I, I want to say sometimes. Okay, so okay, good. We're talking about language. planned languages. Okay. Auxiliary languages. Oh, auxiliary languages. languages. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think about planned languages in terms of, uh, you know, interest. Yeah? Uh, I think you have uh, uh, Esperanto, for example, you like from the leftist, you have Bollapük and stuff like that. You have people who design languages for a certain purpose. 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 Yes. Okay, for example, uh, Esperanto for world peace and revolution and stuff. Okay? Okay. It comes from a, from a leftist background. Okay, and now I tell you, uh, I ask you a question, okay? I have a really, 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 uh, my, my favorite planned language, I tell you, is Klinga. Okay? Ah! <laughs> okay. Good Klinga. choice, actually. So you Klinga. can demonstrate a lot by talking about Klingon. Okay, good. Um, let's talk about Klingon. No, let's talk about auxiliary languages. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, the point is, people keep planning and constructing languages. Now, why would they want to do that? I mean, there's tons of languages around. Um, uh, the reason to have auxiliary languages is, well, people want to get to, to a closer understanding of each other, the point is, we want to have a lingua franca for, you know, people completely. But, that's, but that's, that's English. Well, uh, actually it's not English, it's bad English, or um, international English, as people who talk. I'm sorry but for my bad English, <laughs> Evelyn, I'm so sorry. I know. I don't talk anymore. You could, I mean, you could do bad. Okay. So, no, yeah, that's, uh, that's international English. Okay. Um, but, of course, there will always be... A a form of resistance against international English because as a national language uh, English comes with certain connotations, it comes with uh, religious connotations, it comes with cultural connotations. Um, so people say we need a neutral approach to a world language. So what I answer to that is that as you just pointed out, even the auxiliary languages that we plan and construct come with cultural burdens because uh, one example for an auxiliary language is occidental so I mean yeah <laughs> where would oriental be then so <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah but the point is um, we linguists tend to say that there's never anything redundant in languages so even a planned language certainly is there because of a reason because some people want to talk it um, I have I don't have the numbers 
in my head about how many native speakers there are for languages like Esperanto. Most of the auxiliary languages Nate, actually, there can't be any native don't have Esperanto has. Native speakers. There are people who raise yeah. their children in Esperanto. <laughs> it's a couple of thousands. I, I, I think that, that needs a woo. Woo. Okay. So, but most of the other auxiliary languages don't have any native speakers. So, how can it become really a world language? There are more. There are more native yeah. speakers. Speaking. So you have a lot. Yeah. So that's a good that's a good point to start from. Okay. Can we talk about Klingon now? Sure. What do you want to know? <laughs> everything. Okay. 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 Everything. You know, uh, the, the, good, uh, the funny thing about Klingon is, well, it was constructed mainly uh, for entertainment reasons, which is a good thing. People want to be entertained. Yeah. So uh, what's funny though is that Paramount claims to own the language. <laughs> Which I think is well, so it's an interesting. Do I get you right that you think, uh, or, or is it it's a fact that uh, Klingon is a copyrighted language? Well, I think Paramount thinks so, actually. Okay. Uh, but you know. Um, but I know that uh, it, you cannot uh, publish lists of Klingon words on your website. I know that because Paramount is suing. People who who are, who are typing Klingon languages, uh, Kling, Klingon Klingon words from uh, from the Klingon uh, uh, dictionary. Yeah, but I think you know the whole uh, film industry suing people for something is a whole lot of different discussion. Um, in the end, but I mean the question is, how can a language be copyrighted? That's the question. Well, you can. I mean. Basically, every nation does it to a certain amount mm -hmm. because every nation uh, obviously uses language to, you know, uh, to pass laws, to have rules and regulations. You need language. Okay. So, uh, in order to to make that system work, you need to have kind of um, a power on over the language. Okay. So, like, let's talk about French. I mean, you look like Cardinal Richelieu tonight, very beautiful. And Cardinal Richelieu actually founded the oh. Académie Française, yeah, yeah. which rules over French with an iron fist, one could say. So, if the Académie Française says it's forbidden to use the term Walkman and you have to use the, the term Baladeur, then that's <laughs> the fucking law. I mean, the, the National Assembly will pass the law. According to what the so do you so think that, that so then, then, then French is uh, like a planned language in some mm, well yes it's a controlled language it's a controlled okay. language so uh, but every language has its tendencies to do that like every state has their tendencies to do that like in German they're just trying to rule out anglicisms too isn't it mm -hmm. is that the case I mean there are some people who highly ridiculous. Even in Fre even with Fran with with French, um, of course you have the laws and like publicists, people who publish books or pass laws have to act according to the rules with their language. But what do I, as a 15-year-old uh, youth in France, care if I should say Balladeur? It's my fucking Walkman, and you know, go fuck. It is. I would say that's a good point. Thank you. Go fuck. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Evelyn. Uh, it was a pleasure having you uh, not talking about Klingon a lot. Uh, it's fine. Uh, at least, I mean, if you have Klingon, you can, like, you know, man, there are many, many uh, translations of, of Klingon, of, like, Shakespeare into Klingon and stuff like that. You can reassemble. You can, uh, yeah, whatever. What for? What for? What for? What for? I'm so sorry. What for? It's, it's your fault. It's I mean, my fault. I, yeah. Uh, I'm not moving now. You're not moving at all, and that's fine. Uh, I think uh, we skip the next one, yeah. and uh, we go uh, to a short discussion about uh, how the internet works, okay? That's very, very important here in this, in this situation. How does the internet work, okay? Uh, to approach people via the internet, you have to speak the language of the web fluently, if I can tell it in that way, Evelyn. The language of the internet. But to learn this language is not easy. And first, first, you think about the content. The content that you want to present over the internet. 
Okay? The content usually emerges out of your personal interest. For example, what's your personal interest? Pornography. Pornography, okay. <laughs> so you produce pornography and you put it on the internet. Yeah. Okay, fine, yeah? Uh, or out of business reasons. You could start a porn business, for yeah, example. Yeah. That's fine, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I'll give you an example how the internet works. Okay, uh, you find uh, uh, two dead, nearly rotten pigeons in your backyard, okay? You see the pigeons, okay? Uh, they are in different states of decay, okay? Now you pour vodka over them, okay? <laughs> and you build two small fireplaces on top of the uh, carcasses, okay? Yeah? Uh, and now you burn the pigeons, okay? <laughs> yeah? And now you set up an internet homepage and you present the content, okay? Uh, you present it to the world via blog entries, for example, or mailing lists, and now you observe pages such as slash dot or boing boing and uh, look for keywords, uh, keywords like cremating pigeons, sickos, lol, on Technorati, uh, and uh, if you don't get listed on those sites, uh, you uh, start again. And this time you burn a reptile or a mammal or a catfish or something like that. Uh, and if you wish, you could um, enter uh, terms like uh, pyromanical, sedimentopistic, homobestic onto your homepage. Uh, and this way, you could attract people who like to burn themselves while having sex with dead male horses <laughs> to your internet homepage, okay? Uh, and uh, sometimes it works. Uh, and sometimes not. But we have a major player on the liquid surface of the web, of the net, here tonight. And I would like to have a big, 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 big applause for Regine Debati, because she's waiting a long time to get on stage. Hello. Welcome. Hello, hello. Uh, I hope the microphone is working. There is not working a lot of the things tonight, but whatever. It's a pleasure having you here on the talk show. Uh, you are uh, you are like one of the main characters on a really, really, really prominent weblog. Many, many, many people people read your opinion uh, about new media art uh, and about the world. Uh, but tonight you said that you don't want to talk about new media art at all. Yes. The microphone. The microphone doesn't work. Okay. So okay. Maybe. Ah. Maybe like. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you don't want to talk about uh, 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 net art at all, and you uh, sent us a really, really nice slogan: "The meat is the media." Okay. Uh, so you want to talk about that? So, well, what is it? Okay. Well, oh, um. You to ask me why don't you want to talk about this? Okay, that's a good idea. Okay, so maybe we could do it together. Why don't you want to talk about new media? Okay? Because I've done it too often. Um, okay, so it's getting boring. And, and yeah, and I go to all these conferences and exhibitions, and I really, really need a break from, from new media art. Yeah, it's okay, okay for us. What? It's okay for us. Yeah, okay, cool. We're, cool. We're, we're doing uh, new media art a lot, and we're uh, all, all the time upsetting us about new media art, so it's, it's fine. It's okay, fine. okay, join the club. Okay, yes. Yeah. And you join too, okay? Okay, now the meat. Okay, the meat. <laughs> yeah, so I, I got interested, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this, this first one, because I changed my mind, and, and the second neither, okay. and not this uh -huh. one. But, but the frog. But it's so nice. Yeah, the frog. Oh, well. it, was, it was the story of a guy, because I, so I, I used to talk about new media art, and I'm still talking about digital art and art with electronics, but there are other technologies, so-called emerging technologies, which are emerging for a long time, but that's, that's a detail, and some of them are nanotechnology, but also biotechnology. So today, I'd like to talk about biotechnology. And again, I wanted to talk about has been close to it, because it's not nice to show pictures and not explain.
explain what it was. Mm -hmm. So he decided to spend one week in a, in a cage with all creatures that he would find in a laboratory and see how they would interact, like how the frogs reproduce themselves and after some point he got, ang he got hungry so he started eating the frogs and and the mice the mice the, 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 the frogs like the the guy the the, the guy ate the frogs yeah he, he like he was traveling but I wanted to talk about it once so okay okay so yeah it's very but what is, is the chicken what is it no no that one is about um um artists harnessing biotechnology to make people think about you know when do you talk do you think about bio biotechnology in your life. When do you think about biotechnology? Uh, like you wake up in the morning and think about uh, that? Of course I think, of, yeah. I, I think, oh, it's, it's interesting how, how my uh, uh, body is producing s uh, such like really interesting yellow stuff uh, when I go to the toilet, for example. Okay, but that's biotechnology, that's biotechnology. For you it is. For, for, for me it is, yeah. because I'm, I'm, I'm stupid. Uh, yeah. Okay, no, I, I think about biotechnology a lot, because there is a lot of blah, 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 discussion in the public media about blah, 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 you know. You have like, gene, are there genes everywhere? Yeah, but stuff? it's still yeah. very far away from your, from your everyday life. You don't imagine it arriving in your life. You don't okay. imagine it directly. So does that maybe, mean... Maybe we should, yeah. ask, we should ask Roland. Do you, yeah. do you think about biotechnology? Never. Really? No, never. You're lying. <laughs> no, I never think okay. about it. Except no, I'm, no, talking no, no. I'm talking to you, or you are calling me and saying, Oh, I'm on the toilet and there's this uh, strange yellow thing coming out of me. That's biotechnology, but... <laughs> except that, never. Okay, okay, okay. 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 But let's go on, okay? So it's, it's, it's far away from everyday life. Uh, Yes. So, so the designers and the artists try to make it tangible and give a bit shocking examples to make it think and, and remember that the technology is there. So this one is, is quite an iconic and famous example of these artists who decided to make um, a jacket where no animal would be, would be hard. It's a leather jacket. And so what they did, they, the, they took cells from living animals, from mice, and from human beings, they, they put them together and they glue them in, for, in the shape of a little jacket inside the bioreactor. Oh, don't, don't. <laughs> in shape of a, of a little uh, jacket. So okay. It's very small, it's just for, for, for mouse. It's, it's a mouse jacket, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but then they showed it to people and said, what do you think uh, of this? Like, this is the jacket of the future, maybe. And no animal has suffered, they're still living. And the people were absolutely disgusted. <laughs> they would rather wear. Um, a jacket with a dead animal and not think about what happened. But um, it makes us think that, yeah, the technology is very far away from our life. But on the other hand, if you, if you show example like this, suddenly it arrives in your everyday life, in your, in your living room and in your cupboard and stuff like that. So, yeah, what they did also before, um, they invited people to, to eat some very uh, special kind of steaks. So they had a, a frog, a living one, and they, they performed a biopsy and they took a, a cell from the, from the frog and they grew it in, from, in, in sh the shape of a steak. And they were in France, which is the country of the Nouvelle Cuisine. And so they cooked the... So they, they grew it in... like the steak was little like this. And um, they cooked it and they invited people to come and eat it. It was, it was not really delicious at all. Um, but the frog was still living, and, and it was really, I mean, people were really shocked, and uh, apparently one of them even got sick and vomited, but um, I read recently in the press that uh, that's the future. Uh, there are growing stacks of whatever meat you want okay. in, in petri dishes now, and it's possible, it's just not not yet commercially viable uh, and of course people find it horrible so the okay. question is is it really more horrible than, than eat meat with uh, you know the, uh, the nasty they put in meat and uh, you know you could have meat which has no hormone and has only the good the good uh, fat like the fat you, you find in fish and stuff like that so it looks disgusting but when you think about yogurt it has also I have to ask a question to the audience is there any uh, vegan person here. So a person that like has like this, the belief system vegan. No. no. 
Come on, no single vegan guy or a girl here? I can't believe it. Okay. Vegetarian would be okay. Vegetarian, okay, vegetarian. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What? Are you? No, you're not vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, would you eat uh, like a petri dish um, steak? I, I, yeah, but maybe I'm the wrong example because I don't like meat for its taste. I, like, I can eat meat if it doesn't look like meat. I can eat like it. sausages. Yeah, if it's hidden in something. Else, it's so, if they would grow a sausage, then you would eat it. Yeah, probably. Okay. Probably. But then imagine okay. if, if if it was possible, like you could go in a restaurant and, and order a steak of Julia Roberts or, or oh. someone you really love. And you could also eat stuff you're not supposed to eat, like eat sausages of, of leopard and, and stuff like that. Mm. I, I, I think I think a grow a new kind of fetish. Um, <laughs> eating Julia Roberts. Come on. <laughs> the eating the lips of Julia Roberts. Oh, eating your pet. Yeah, it's in myself, of course. We did that. We did what? Eat ourselves. Oh, yeah, yeah, but actually we did it some time ago. Yeah. We, we made blood sausage and oh of our blood and ate it. Oh, of course. Okay. <laughs> Go to our homepage, photograph.at. <laughs> homepage. And we'll find it there, okay. But, okay, maybe you should go to the next picture because that's a really interesting one. <laughs> it's Stevie Kurtz, okay? Not, uh, come on. <laughs> Stevie Kurtz is a really great guy. and. Uh, you wanted to tell us a story about it because I know the story, but maybe people in the audience don't know the story. Uh, I'm sure many people know it, but yeah, the project I showed before, it's um, I found it great, and I think that the artists are, are really very clever and smart. But they were lucky because they were collaborating with a, with a research um, institute, and they were living in Australia. And Steve Kurtz is doing the same kind of project but he's living in the US. And he was preparing a show, and um, the show was about, I mean, sure, checking whether what we are eating uh, and what is sold in supermarket is something organic and safe and no uh, orga uh, um, genetically modified organism, if it's really like that. So he had his little scientist equipment. It was in 2004, his wife died during her sleep, so he called what was it? 911? 911, yeah. Okay, so they arrived and they thought, yeah, this guy is playing the little chemist, that's very, very strange. So they called, next slide. So they called the, oh, the FBI and the CIA, and, and he was accused of bioterrorism, and they cordoned his, his house, and they tried so to. He, he was basically working with chemicals and bio stuff yeah, it as, was as an art project. Yeah, and it was really safe. Like it was stuff he had bought legally, and, and okay. there was no problem. And he was preparing a, an exhibition, and the work was commissioned. And, but okay. but then he got into trouble, and, and three years after, he's still having trouble. He's right. out of prison, but he has to pay the lawyer uh, and stuff like that. May, yeah. Maybe you should say, "Oh my God, the Americans." Or something. No, no, yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but it's true. So, I mean, it's so playing with biotechnology is exciting, but it's, it can be also, of course, expensive. Not yeah. everybody can do it, but also dangerous. Okay. So, my point with the last project, but I'm not sure we still have the time. Pardon? I'm not sure we still have the time. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. Okay. I mean, I have, I have this little man in my, in my ear, you see? This little man, yeah? Okay. What does he say? He actually sits over there and he always says, uh, we have 13 minutes, we have 13 minutes. So if, if I stare at you strangely, then he's talking to me. But yeah. you're yeah. staring at me strangely all the time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So but he's not always talking. <laughs> so that was, that's one of the projects of Steve Cools, but we can go at, at the next slide. <gasps> oh, this one? Not the one. Okay. Are, they, are they growing hair, or what is this? Yes, this is that. So, um, there are designers who know that they cannot really prototype and do crazy things because they are not rich enough. Um, uh, but they are still exploring biotechnology and trying to raise awareness of people because these things are still in the laboratories and God knows what will happen when they will move out of the laboratories and, and you know, biotechnology research is financed by, by big corporation and it's, it's done for their own interest and we don't have any a say in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one is about a guy, is a guy who wanted to investigate death and what, how will we... Death? Death. Like, like, like dying, like... People okay, dying. Yeah. 
So in the Victorian era, era okay. people were carrying um, a lock of hair of someone they liked in a, in a necklace. Mm. So imagine in the time of biotechnology area, era, what will happen is that people will just keep a hair of someone they like, and they will just put it in this, this kind of dish, and um, you see it, it is um, um, giving food to the, to the air, so the, the air keeps growing. Next slide. Thank you. Oh. And then there's this romantic image of you can still live with, with part of the, the person you have loved. So you 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 like you have your little rituals. In the morning you feed the air and you, you have breakfast with, with the air and you wash them every day. And then you watch TV and you caress the air like if it was your, your lover and voila. Can, can, can I get a little bit of your hair? Stupid jokes. Yeah, Actually we have that we have scissors. No. Yes, we are. Forget it. But I mean, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I could grow, like, for example, my parents died. I could grow, like, uh, like a little bit of hair of my father in my face, for example. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to do that. So I, no. <laughs> but, I, I, but, there's, but, but there are strange people out there, so I don't know. Yeah, they're full out. <laughs> <They're Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Stop laughing, you No, I'm just laughing about you. <laughs> no, I just imagine your the hair of your father in your face. I mean, your father doesn't have so much hair, so you really you really have to collect. Actually, the growing hair is fine from yeah, whatever. A, a couple of people here that need some hair, more hair. Okay, uh, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we have we have a last uh, last slide. Oh, that's close. That's all. Yeah, if we still have the time, I can also yeah. explain. No, we don't. A little bit, little bit. Two sentences about that. Oh that? no, that's, that's unfair. That's unfair. Oh. It's another project where they imagine, you know, stem cells. Okay. They will save our life and they will be used in 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 um, medicine and the world will be perfect and we uh -huh. won't be sick anymore. But will it be that simple? What what will be the consequences, social and cultural? So this they are imagining that maybe like you know there are people saying their hair because they are they are poor. People will just use their body to grow stem cells. Stem cells. Stem cells samples. Uh, which will be, which oh. will be born. Stem cell sample. Sample. Good. Ten times very quickly. Yeah, oh, stem cell samples, stem cell samples, stem cell samples. You make stem cell samples. Stem cell samples, stem cell samples, stem cell samples. It's like body count. You need to kiss now, forget it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, it was, sorry, sorry, it was not funny. <laughs> Sorry, audience, that was not funny. Okay. Yes, it was. Thank you, Evelyn, member you're, of Mother You're my Co girlfriend. Come on, you don't count. <laughs> yes, fun. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> okay, so. Can you really want me to finish that one? Yeah, yeah please, please. Um, so I don't know if there's still another image after yeah. that. Oh yeah, so they will grow stem cells on their body and then sell, sell them at a, at a company. And uh, they will be they will be very happy because they will know they will contribute to the to the well-being of someone who needs stem cells, fresh stem cells to, to get better. And also they will be paid, but it will depend what what is the demand of stem cell and the quality of the, the harvest of stem cells. So it's um it's not really science fiction. It's not forecasting. It's just trying to imagine what biotechnology or nanotechnology could bring to our life and yeah, make it more close to okay. what we are. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's fine. It's, uh, I, I get it. I get it. Okay. Did you get it? Yeah. Did you get the yeah. message? Okay. If the audience got the message, I would say uh, thank uh, you. What? You forgot something. And uh, I want to ask Karin to come back on the stage because we have a present for our guests. Ah, yes, we have a present for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, and for Karin, please, please, Karin, yes, come yes, to yes, the yes. stage. Ah, you get a present. Uh, actually, I, we didn't grow it ourselves, just stuff like that. It's uh, it's t-shirts. Uh, and I think, yep. So, what, what's your size, actually? Medium. Uh, uh, I would say, uh, and scientist is something for you, is it? Yeah. 
Okay, I would say Psy and Scientist in 40 is fine. Should be fine. Psy and Scientist in 40. Uh, and we have, oh my god, they use a history which repeats itself. Uh, and I, have, uh, I was a copyright infringement in a previous life. <laughs> You can order them at our website. Uh, I would say, take all of them with you and decide. You'll get one, one t-shirt okay. each, okay? Yes, yes. Thank you. No problem, no problem. Thank you for uh, uh, being here or for leaving the stage now. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, a big applause for the Shit Nevati. And of course, for Karin Arasa. Good, the microphone, put it. Uh, I should turn it off? Yeah, turn it off. Yes, I turn it off. Well done. Okay. Uh, maybe that's a little thing uh, from Regine now. Uh, we uh, had... Where is my... There it is. Uh, in 2005, uh, our monochrome member, uh, Günther Friesinger, uh, that's Günther Friesinger here, uh, visited a biennial in Mongolia, yes? Uh, and afterwards, from Mongolia, he flew to Miami Beach, okay, uh, to attend one of the biggest art fairs in the world, the Art Basel Miami Beach. Woo! Okay? Uh, he did what every good artist uh, does on such a big art fair, talk to collectors, yeah, shake hands, and of course, spread business cards, okay? That's what you do. Uh, the problem was he was infected with a deadly virus called Eret 2, okay? And we formed a task team to get Günther Friesinger back and all the 500 contaminated business cards he was spreading at the fair. He was walking around <laughs> contaminated business cards everywhere, everywhere. We had a problem. We had to ask many, many people. We had to ask the security guards. Where is Günther Friesinger? He's, he's infecting us. He, he'll kill the world population. We even had to find him in like stupid art. Look at that. <laughs> everywhere. Artworks. Everywhere. Business cards. We had to find him. Uh, uh, people were really concerned and asked a lot of questions uh, like, is it terrorism or uh, do you have to evacuate the city or something like that, okay? But finally we found Günther in his best western hotel room. <laughs> we dragged him to the bathroom and dissolved him with acid. <laughs> that's what we did and that's how we saved the world. Uh, and then we cloned him and there he's sitting and doing the technical stuff tonight. Okay, about Günther Friesinger. Okay. Change the... No, no, come on. Okay. Um, that? No, it's okay. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, any anti-nuclear activists here? Come on. No weekends, no... No weekends, no anti-nuclear activists? No, that's so 80s! Oh, that's so 80s! <laughs> all the time. And I tell you something. Don't go there. It's my hate. It's my hate. It's my hate. Yeah, yeah. It's your hate. It's my hate. I have, a, I have a quote for you, okay? It's by a strange guy called James Lovelock, and he's right about this one. If you want, you can read it with me. I have never regarded nuclear radiation or nuclear power as anything other than a normal and inevitable part of the environment. Our prokaryotic forebears evolved on a planet-sized lump of fallout from a star-sized nuclear explosion, a supernova, a synthesized element that go to make our planet and ourselves. So, actually, he's pro-nuclear energy, and I read this quote, and now I'm pro-nuclear energy myself. <laughs> I like it. You like it too? Yes, I like it. There's a lot of debating about the right operating system. I mean, we are in the OS, come on. Uh, we are in Seabase here, they are all the time. Well, Apple versus Linux versus Apple versus Linux all the time. OpenBSD versus OpenBSD, whatever. I tell you, we have a small song about the right operating system, okay? Well, well, um, and yeah. I, you don't know to play it? I, I, I know to play it, but I don't know what uh, our guitar, man the guitar sounds. The guitar is no okay, proper instrument. Let's sing it like this. Okay? Let's sing it like this. Let's sing it like this. You have to imagine the guitar. Sing without me. 
Yes, they're singing without music. You don't know this because you're not interested in operating systems. You, yeah. But we dedicate a song for you, okay? Oh. We dedicate it for you. Okay. Madame. Hmm? Madame. <laughs> okay. So we start in German and then we'll sing it in English. Oh. Imagine the so-called Hackbrett. Uh -huh. An Austrian <laughs> instrument. <laughs> Should we start? So imagine. Okay. And two, three, four. Sie haben wenig Spaß, Madame. Das sag ich gleich auch je, Madame. Ihr Rechner wird geohnt, Madame. Sie werden nicht verschont, Madame. Setzen Sie ein Ubuntu auf und treten dann Problemchen auf. Niemand sieht sie kaum. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, that's very fast. Okay. okay, now in English. You're running with next speed, madam. I tell you, you're not free, madam. Cause your notebook will be hacked, madam. I'm sorry, that's a fact, madam. Get the Ubuntu to start up this. There might be problems, but less risk. How extra How extra How extra How extraordinary? How extraordinary brisk. Okay, okay. And now we have a short movie for you about the media, about the dead media. Welcome to the product release party for Sound Blaster Blitzkrieg 3.0. The IT elite is thrashing to the newest rhythms of DJ AC DJ. Death scene. Out of sight. Cool dudes. We are the champions. I've got Falco running around my brain. Data storage devices are doing the limbo. MySpace plugins have the Lombada fever and are wrapping themselves around GPS navigation interfaces. The juice is flowing and the circuits are buzzing. But there's a sudden boom! Lightning! Fire! What's going on? What the fuck was that? From the pillar of fire emerges the all-knowing cuneiform tablet. A frosty breeze wisps over the crowd. The cuneiform tablet speaks. Yeah! Just go on dancing! Dance! Wallow in your cesspool of arrogance and pride! You think that you are already at the end of time? You think that you are the peak, the utopia, the paradise, the zenith? Just because you are omnipresent for a short second on the world stage? <laughs> Have a nice time, you heretical brute! Just keep on laughing. Yeah, about your forefathers. Trample over the graves of the dead media of the past. Nah! Why aren't you laughing? Did the laugh get stuck in your throat? If you ask me, laughing is kind of an inadequate reaction. Swine! You all climbed up out of the unending white noise and soon enough you'll be flushed back down again. You'll rot like the overripe fruit on the tree! Hey, must I know it all? Who told you all that stuff? Silence, USB stick! Now I will let flow the endless stream of life before your eyes. We see it. The coded messages of ladies' fans at Renaissance courts, the telegram, the magic lantern, the eight-track tape, Neolithic bone calendars, video 2000, the player piano, the messenger pigeon, the Apple Newton. Everything tumbles into the voids, forming ebb. It might already be on the morn that you are all erased, and nothing will be left of your vain hubris. But a stop on Wikipedia! 
Yeah, but the future is in hypertext, no? That deserves a sound blogging. You motherfucking CD-ROM, your data is also going to disappear forever into unreadability, and your aluminium coating will give up the ghost. You can't do that. My data, my sweet daisy, daisy. What? What is that? Clapping hands. First hesitant and spotty, and then building to a clamoring ovation. Oh, that's it. It was all a cleverly planned surprise show. And I thought, now the cuneiform tablet is open, and out comes Ars Electronica Chief Gefried Stocker. Bravo, bravo, very impressive. How true, how true, isn't it? For a long time, we wanted to do uh, a film with Aris Elektroniker Chef Gerfried Stocker, and we finally made it. Made yeah. it. He looks he, like that, really. He looks really like that. Yeah, because uh, of the picture. Okay. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, many, many, many of you are working in offices. I know that. I know that. I can smell it. I smell your officeness. Okay? Uh, an office, if you don't know it, if you don't work in an office, an office is room or an area in which people work, okay? What? Art. Yeah, what, of course. Uh, that's the precariat. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, art, 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 commonly refers to an act or process of making material works uh, that hold uh, a certain creative impulse, okay? That's art. And now we are researching in a new field called office art. You know what's office art? <laughs> office art is a regular technique used by people in white collar working situations. Uh, there may not necessarily be a creative impulse to do office art, but the impulse of overcoming general boredom or the necessity to help office workers keeping focus during, you know, telephone conversations where people start scribbling around and stuff like that. Okay? Or during office meetings, okay? We created a page dedicated to collecting office art. So please send us your office art. And now we'll present you a couple of submissions we've got. Yeah. Okay? Um, the title is Yeah, and it's Drawing on Envelope. Ah, nice. Yeah. Okay. This one is called The Process. It's pencil on pink post it note. Okay. <laughs> You get it? You get it? <coughs> Digital clock, a study. <laughs> I like this one. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we have one with a, with context. Context. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to read the context? I, I read the context. Okay. okay. Uh, I uh, my my name now is Christopher Frelin, who sent us this one, and he writes. I'm stuck at my computer all day. I'm lucky enough to have Photoshop installed. I'm in an office and this is my art. You see? You see? Ha 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 Yeah. Yeah. But I, I really like the, like, uh, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Okay, we, I think we go on to the next one. We're <laughs> The Sorrow Eater. Ah, the Sorrow Eater. Mm. <laughs> Kade mm, whatever. whatever. Whatever, yeah. Possibly sorry. Point ah. and shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Le petit prince reloaded. <laughs> I love I really For your XML only. <laughs> oh but thank Yes, yes. Okay. Another drool inducing meeting. I really like this one. There's a little bit of cubism mixed in. Yeah, yeah. too much, I think. Too much. <laughs> and the last one, ah. The vampire shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have any context. No, I don't no, have any no context. context. So but I can tell you, in office space, no one can see you draw. So start doing office art and upload that uh, to our homepage. That's the homepage down there. And if you like, you can add a little bit of context. That's fine. Uh, you and don't now, have to. Yeah. And now I'm talking about a really, really wonderful problem. What problem am I talking about? What problem? 
Um, I think you are talking about an outside context problem. The outside context problem. Because the outside context problem is really interesting if you want to uh, think about our society. An outside context problem, or OCP, so if you know Robocop, that has nothing to do with that, okay? OCP is any problem outside a given group's experience with an immediate and lasting impact upon it. There is, uh, I think we need a victim from the audience. Maybe Tim, come on Tim. Come on. Tim. We need you, we need you. I'm the victim. Yeah, you're the victim, okay? So, uh, maybe maybe just sit down and put, or, oh, you can stay. If, oh, uh, no problem. Okay. Whatever you need. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you uh, just imagine. Should I switch it on? Uh, yeah, maybe if you, like, if you want to talk. Yeah, but do I have to talk? No, no but it's fine, it's fine. Okay, that's Tim. Tim, Tim is, I like Tim, okay? We all like Tim. Uh, we all like Tim. And now, Tim, just imagine that you're part of a tribe, okay? Yeah. Of a tribe on a fertile island. It looks like that, okay? Okay? You're part nice. of this island, yeah? You tamed the land, okay? I did what? You tamed the land. Oh, yeah, okay. Funny. You tamed the land, finally, yeah? You invented the wheel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah did. You, you invented the wheel. Yeah, you, you, invent, uh, you invented writing and many, many things. You as a tribe, not you as a person, but ah. you as a tribe. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, uh, your neighbor, uh, your neighbor, uh, neighbors. Can, can we say neighbors? Your neighbor tribes. Your neighbor tribes were uh, very cooperative or enslaved. What do you prefer? Should it be enslaved? Enslaved. 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 Okay. So your uh, your neighbors are all enslaved. And you are in a position of absolute power, okay? That's so fantastic. try, try to try to show it. Try to show the absolute power you're 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 feeling. Show it to us. <laughs> what? And, and now it goes. <laughs> and the, the chest is wide open. Okay, no, it, it's fine. It's fine. It's good. It's good. Okay. Uh, but suddenly, suddenly. Uh, a strange thing uh, made out of iron, like this, uh, appears on the sea uh, and trailing steam uh, in the bay. And what do you think? About the steam? Yeah. And about the iron thing? Um. Oh my god. Yes! <laughs> yeah. We have the central element of the out of context problem. People thinking, oh my god, yes, guys carrying long, funny-looking sticks like this, for example, yeah, uh, come ashore and announce that you've been discovered. Okay? Okay. So, what, what do you think when somebody tells you you're discovered? I feel lonely. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Now, you're a subject to the emperor, and you don't even actually know the emperor, and the emperor is keen on presence, and he calls it tax. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. And uh, there are a couple of bright-eyed holy men, like we, and uh, we want to talk to your priests. Yes, that's, uh, that's fine, but they are um, out of office. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well. well, I would say uh, that's a really strange, uh, a strange process that your society is now going through, and uh, like about 200 years later, your island looks like that. <laughs> Yeah. Do, do, do you feel uh, strange? Uh, no. 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 Okay. I think that's, that's Tim. He doesn't feel strange and that's why we love him. Give him a big applause! Uh, I want to sit. Turn it off, please. I turn it off. I turn it off. Ah, uh, he turned it off. He's a pro seat. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank okay. You. So, uh, but now. We have to ask Krach. Krach. I mean, uh, a possible example of an out of context problem nowadays would be the arrival of space traveling extraterrestrials on Earth. Okay? So people coming here landing, landing with a UFO like this, for example, and then you think, oh my god. Okay? Uh, Krach, what do you think about stuff like that? I mean, you are from outer space, aren't you? Uh, I don't know. Um, what did he say? I don't know. I don't know. Ah, you don't remember. Okay. Um, 
um, you don't oh, remember oh. where you are from, or you don't remember what uh, we write that you should say now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, as you could make a little bit of music. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, make, make, make music. Yeah, make, make music, make music. Crack, ladies and gentlemen. And he makes music.
have to come to an end, or? Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. Yeah. Krach, I love it, Robert. Thank you very much, Evelyn Ferlinger, for helping Krach survive. Uh, I think he's going to the sleep mode now. We need you on stage because it's the end, and we have a final song for our audience. And I think uh, we have to get you a microphone because you know, I mean, there is only uh, there is only one reason why we are here tonight. And why we bore you to hell or whatever. Or why we were you entertained you? I don't know. Uh, there's one reason for, it, for that. And it's called networking. Okay? Some people, you know, that they should hear network. Network, network. We have to network it out. And now we want to sing a song for you, together with you, about networking. And if you'd like to join in, they should join in. Should yeah, they? they should join in. Yeah. yeah. It's a country song. It's a country song, and I hope you get into the mood if you hear the first lines, the first chorus, maybe you get it. Okay, Günther Friesinger. Ah, Krach, Krach, please! He's, you're in sleep mode, but could you turn it on? And could you start one more time? We have to restart it. Okay, now. Okay. Meeting people all across the universe. Give them a smile, give them a try Go for a ride on blue planet Earth You can be high in the sky Let's network it out Let's network it out I can network Yeah. 